hello uh, yeah mr saket are you there yes i am there yes okay uh, good afternoon everyone uh, this is jitendra from i bombay chapter thanks for joining this uh, webinar session so today's webinar session is conducted by mr saket modi uh, he is a uh, saket is actually the founder and director of square mile global consulting it is a financial training and consulting company the headquarters is located in london Saket is specialized in uh, providing a training courses on financial reporting and analysis, particularly with regards to international financial reporting standards, Indian Account Standard (INDS) also, and uh, in, he is also the international public sector accounting standard also he carry out. In addition to being a chartered accountant, Saket is a CFA, is uh, is a ch charter financial analyst. So, Mr. Saket, uh, 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 thanks uh, for today's uh, presentation. So, today we are having a presentation. Uh, on India's 116, which cover the leases. Hello, huh? Mr. Saket. Uh, yeah. So you yes. uh, you can uh, uh, yeah you can leave this presentation now. Thank okay, you very thank much you. for everyone. Okay, thank you, Jitendra. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar on Ind AS 116 leases. just a quick disclaimer that the presentation has been prepared for this webinar only and it does not constitute advice and should not be used for the purpose of advising clients. Uh, Jitendra has already introduced me so I won't go into the details but uh, if you would like to stay in touch feel free to connect on LinkedIn after the webinar. Uh, the link uh, to my profile is given. Uh, and we can stay in touch. So let's start with the learning outcomes for the next one hour. We will look at the impact of IND AS 116 on the balance sheet, profit and loss, and cash flow statement. There is a new definition of lease. What is a lease? And also an option to separate the non lease or service component of the contract from the lease component. So we will look at some examples on that. India S116 allows short-term and low-value asset exemptions, which means there will not be an asset or liability recognized if these optional exemptions are taken. So we will look at what those actually mean. We will look at the new lessee accounting model in detail, which is the big change, including initial recognition and subsequent measurement of lease assets and liabilities. Now, some of you may know the effective date is 1st April 2019, and the transition options, which again we will go through a bit later, will have an impact on the financial statements. One thing that does not really change is lessor accounting. So if you are a lessor, uh, then the impact is less, but we will still do a quick review of principles. The impact for lessors is mainly with regards to additional disclosures. So an entity has various options when it comes to obtaining an asset for use in the business. It can be an outright purchase for cash without any financing, or the entity can borrow money, say for example, take a loan from the bank, or it can enter into a leasing arrangement. So a lease is a financing arrangement where generally the legal ownership remains with the supplier while the customer has rights to use the asset. And the residual value risk is generally with the lessor who has the legal ownership. What is important to note is that leases could be of high value assets like buildings or airplanes, or relatively low value assets like laptops, tablets, and photocopiers. This is particularly relevant in India's 116, which has exemptions for low value assets. And we will look at this in more detail 
later. NDS 116 is based on the International Financial Reporting Standard IFRS 16 leases, which is also a new standard for leases. And Hans Huger was the chairman of the International Accounting Standards Board made a statement which you can see IFRS standards bring transparency by enhancing the international compatibility and quality of financial information, enabling investors and other market participants to make informed economic decisions. Now, the problem we've had all these years is with regards to the operating lease treatment by the lessee. Because even if you have an uh, arrangement which is classified as operating lease, the lessee has a right to use the asset and obligations to pay for it over a period of time. But we never saw an asset or a liability recognized on the balance sheet. And this was a problem mainly for the users of financial statements like analysts who said, look, whether you classify a lease as operating or a finance lease, you know, finance lease is one where the risk and rewards are transferred, operating lease is one where they are not transferred. You know, you have different accounting treatments, so the asset is used to generate revenues in the business. And when no asset or liability is recognized, there is a misleading impression of the lessee's leverage because those obligations are not on the balance sheet. The analysts have been aware about this and they always made adjustments to the financial statements that were signed off, but they lacked sufficient information to be able to make appropriate adjustments in respect of operating leases. The other issue has been with regards to those rights and obligations not being recognized which is conflicting with the conceptual framework. So what NDS 116 does is rectifies all this and what we will have now is a single lessee accounting model where all leases will be treated in the same way and assets and liabilities will be recognized. So there will not be any off balance sheet financing. And to put all this in perspective, there was a survey done a few years back of the large listed companies using IFRS or US GAAP. And what the survey found was that there was 3.3 trillion US dollars of lease commitments disclosed in the notes and over 85%, which is approximately 3 trillion US dollars of lease commitments do not appear on the balance sheet. So these are obligations that entities have, unavoidable, but they do not appear as liabilities. And to put this figure of $3 trillion in perspective, it is approximately three times the GDP, the gross domestic product of the two largest economies in Africa, Nigeria and South Africa. Their total GDP is about 1 trillion US dollars, times it by three, that's the level of lease commitments that come on the balance sheet from this year globally. The US gap has also been updated for the new lease accounting requirements, though there are some deviations on how operating leases would be recognized in the profit and loss compared to what IFRS or NDAS 116 requires. So what's the big change here? It's with regards to lessee accounting, and all leases will be on the balance sheet with some exceptions. So you have a right of use asset on the balance sheet and a lease liability. The right of use asset will be depreciated or amortized over the lease term, which will be an expense in the income statement. 
and the lease liability will accrue interest and as those payments are made the monthly or quarterly payments are made the lease rentals are paid the liability will reduce but each payment will have interest and principal component now in terms of implementation one of the big issues is around the data with regards to various leases what we've seen with multinational companies is that the data may not be centralized and systems and processes may need to be updated to identify gather and analyze the data to come up with the figures for financial statements for example calculating the lease liability what will also happen is that over time over the lease term the lease liability will reduce as payments are made but in the initial years the interest will be calculated on the outstanding amount of the lease liability which will be higher in the initial years so what we will have is a higher interest expense or finance cost in the initial years of the lease and relatively lower interest expense in the latter years so that's why we call it the front loaded interest expense so most leases will be on the balance sheet as right of use assets and lease liabilities but there are exemptions available for short term and low value assets and these exemptions are optional and if they are taken then we follow the treatment that most of us are used to treat the lease payments as rental expense only no asset or liability is recognized so what is the high level impact of indas 116 all leases or all leasing arrangements will lead to recognition of assets and liabilities assets will be depreciated or amortized if they are intangible assets call it amortization and there will be a finance cost similar treatment to what we had for finance leases previously so what has been fixed is the operating lease treatment for the lessee wherein previously there was only rental expense operating expense now we would recognize assets liabilities depreciation and finance cost there is also going to be an impact on the cash flow statement though the total cash outflow doesn't change you know we still pay what has been agreed between the lessor and the lessee the classification between operating and financing activities that we see in the cash flow statement is impacted so the cash flows from operating activities will go up and the reason they will increase is because previously we had rental expense in the profit and loss now we don't have rental expense instead we have depreciation and interest expense and the cash outflow would consist of the actual interest payment as well as repayment of the principal amount of the obligation and both the cash outflows from interest and repayment of the principal is treated as cash outflow from financing activities so the cash flows from financing activities net inflow will go down or in other words the cash outflows from financing activities will go up and the cash inflows from or net cash flows from operating activities will also go up because the rental expense effectively is switched to financing activities but the total cash outflow does not change and this has an impact uh, for users again because often free cash flows are used in corporate and equity valuations and this change has an impact on the calculations the financial matrix 
uh, is affected we will again look at that a bit later but uh, it is important for the users to be aware of what the impact on the financial statements would be so let's look at an example of uh, a sector which is highly affected by uh, this new standard and this is an extract from future retails half yearly report and it says that from effect from 1st april 2019 the company has adopted ind as 116 leases applied the standard to all lease contracts using a modified retrospective method now the modified retrospective method means it is a retrospective treatment but with no restatement of the comparatives so it is like a simplified method to move to this standard so what you will find in the 2019-20 financial statements is that the current year is based on ind as 116 while the previous period the 2018-19 comparative is going to be based on the previous standard which is in as 17. the company has recorded lease liability and right of use assets and that is done by discounting the lease payments at the incremental borrowing rate on the date of initial application and we will look at the discount rates uh, again there are options so we will look at that in a, in a moment the comparatives have not been uh, restated they have not been retrospectively adjusted that's a result of the modified retrospective uh, method and the last paragraph says uh, there will be an increase in cash inflows from operating activities and increase in cash outflows from financing activities on account of lease payments so there is a reconciliation that they have shown uh, for the half year ended 30th september 2019 and you can see that uh, in on a comparable basis that is the previous standard rent expenses would have been 808.36 crores and uh, as a result of NDS 116 the actual rent expense is only 55.45 crores and that approximately 750 crores uh, difference has been moved to the depreciation amortization and the finance cost line so a clear disclosure in a tabular format of the impact of adopting the new standard and again as i said the retail industry is highly affected because there are a lot of properties on operating leases so one of the things that uh, changes is the definition of the lease itself and the customer now or has to evaluate whether a contract is a lease or not based on the new definition and the lease here is defined as a contract or part of a contract that conveys the right to control the use of an identified asset for a period of time in exchange for consideration and the evaluation of whether an arrangement or a contract is a lease or not is now based on control rather than risk and rewards for the customer so there are a few points to note here from the definition it is possible that only a part of the contract meets the definition of a lease while the other part is a non lease or service component so an example is lease of a motor vehicle with the annual service in included in the contract so the payments that are made by the customer to the supplier include not just the payments for the use of the motor vehicle but also the annual service now the annual service is not part of the lease though it is in the same contract it is also possible to have more than one lease in a contract 
For example, you could have one contract which is about lease of land and office building, or you could have one contract which includes lease of a storage tank. It is essential that there is an identified asset. So let me give you an example on that. Let's say there is a contract between a retailer and an airport operator for space to sell goods for two years. Just so you know, when you, when you go to the boarding areas of the airport, you find vending machines. So let's say there's a retailer who supplies that and they have had an arrangement with the airport operator for space to put up those vending machines. And the contract states that the space or the vending machine could be put up at one of a number of specified boarding areas. So within a boarding area, it could be in one of the corners. And the operator, the airport authority can change the location of the space at any time at minimal cost. It's quite easy to move those vending machines. So the question is, is there an identified asset here? And there is actually no identified asset here as it is possible to change the space used to sell goods. And it is likely that the operator may do so since the cost involved is minimal. And hence this contract is not a lease. So all the rentals that are paid would be treated as a normal operating expense. There's no need to recognize an asset or liability because there is no identified asset. The right to control the use of an asset exists when the customer has right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits from use of the identified asset throughout the period of use and also has the right to direct its use. So the economic benefits from use of an asset could arise from using, holding or subleasing an asset. And if there is exclusive use of the asset throughout the lease term, then it would qualify. The customer has right to direct how and for what purpose the asset is used if it can change these throughout the period of use. So in short, the customer is the one who has all the decision making rights around rights to change the type of output that is produced, when the output is produced, where it is produced, and the quantity that is produced. And what we are looking at here is the substantive rights which affect the decisions, not the protective rights which the supplier may have in order to protect the asset. It is essential that all contracts, all arrangements are evaluated to see whether they meet the definition of lease or not. And in particular, this needs to be done for new contracts from 1st April 2019. With regards to the existing contracts that an entity has at the date of transition, 1st April 2019, there is a practical expedient and you could continue to assume that certain contracts which were classified as leases previously would continue to be leases and those which were not identified as leases are not leases. But with new contracts from April 2019, this assessment has to be made. Now, it is possible that a contract has a lease and non-lease component. And when we have that situation, the entity may choose to separate the two. And the reason it may decide to separate the two is because the standard only applies to the lease component, the payments for the right of use assets. So when a contract contains both the allocation of consideration 
should be based in the ratio of the standalone selling prices. And if the standalone selling prices are not observable, they would need to be estimated based on observable data. So some judgment estimates required here. So for example, if there is a contract to use building and the supplier or the owner also provides maintenance, cleaning services, the lease component is only the building to which the standard should be applied. So for the payments in respect of the building, you recognize the right of use asset and lease liability. There is, however, a practical expedient not to split the two and consider the entire contract as a lease. So all payments for lease and non-lease components are considered as part of the lease. But the disadvantage of that is it results in a higher lease liability because to calculate the lease liability, we are taking all the future cash flows and discounting them back. So this practical expedient is available by class of assets. So again, it is a consideration when this standard is applied. So let's look at an example. Oil company has a contract with a ship owner to charter a particular tanker for 15 years. Oil company decides when and to which ports the tanker sails and the oil to be transported. Under the contract, the ship owner provides the crew that operate and maintain the ship or the tanker. Is this contract a lease? Now, if we apply the definition of lease, the first question is, is there an identified asset? Yes, we do have a specified tanker which has been given for 15 years to the oil company. And does the oil company have a right to control? So the oil company decides when and to which ports the tanker sails and the oil that is to be transported. So it has those decision-making rights, which gives it control. So this contract is a lease. However, what we also have is a non-lease component, which is operating and maintaining the ship. And the oil company has to decide whether it would separate that, split the two components, or treat the entire payment as part of the lease, which will result in a higher lease liability, more debt leverage on the balance sheet. So what are the optional exemptions to which the standard does not apply? So first we have short term, which is contracts which are genuinely less than 12 months. And I say genuinely because if there are there is a right to renew the contract, it is not considered to be short term. So if the lessee is likely to exercise the option to renew, it is not a short-term contract. So if it is less than 12 months, then don't bother about you know, doing all these calculations. It may well not be material and treat the entire payment like we've always done, rental expense as part of operating expense. But this election of short-term exemption is done by class of underlying assets. So for example, buildings is one class of assets. Furniture and equipment could be another class of assets. So if you decide to do it for assets in a particular class, you must make sure you do it for all assets in that class of assets. But what we are required to do is disclose the expense relating to short-term leases. How much has been shown as rental expense relating to short-term leases because there's no asset or liability recognized. The low value asset exemption is on an absolute basis and based on value when the asset is new. So what this exemption is for is to cover 
small items like tablets, computers, photocopiers, small items of furniture, telephones, which may be leased. And the low value, what is low value? The threshold is not defined in the standard, but the common practice is to take the threshold of US dollars 5,000. But remember, this is on an absolute basis and it is based on value when the asset is new. So for example, if you leased a motor vehicle, a secondhand motor vehicle, and at that time its value was 4,000 US dollars, you cannot take this low value asset exemption because we are looking at it, uh, the, we're looking at the value when the asset is new. And this election is on a lease by lease basis. And again, the expense relating to leases of low value assets needs to be disclosed. Now, because it is on absolute basis and generally, you know, the common practice is to take this threshold of US dollar 5,000, you know, you might see instances where you know, you have a billion dollar company uh, and it uses that threshold and you have another company which probably turns around a million dollars and it still uses that same threshold or thereabouts. Also, if you had, for example, let's say 100 leases of tablets. Now in aggregate, you would cross that threshold, but this exemption the election of that is on a lease by lease basis. So even if you had 100 leases of tablets, you could take this low value asset exemption because it is on a lease by lease basis. And the lease payment is recognized mostly on a straight line basis as uh, rentals are paid. Sometimes it can be on a systematic basis to reflect the use of the asset. Another important thing in India's 116 is determination of the lease term. This is a key input as the future payments over the lease term are discounted to get the lease liability. And it is important to note that the lease term includes not just the non cancellable period but also optional renewal periods provided the lessee is reasonably certain to extend the lease or exercise that option to extend. And this is where some judgment is required. And if you thought that at the moment when at the commencement of the lease that the lessee is likely to exercise the option to extend, things could change subsequently and you have to reassess the lease term which would impact the lease liability and the right of use asset. So let's say for example uh, we have a bank which uh, takes a building on lease which will be used as a branch and let's say it's in the city center. Now the contract is for a non-cancellable period of two years with the option to extend it for another two years. So let's say the bank then carries out significant modifications to that leased premises. You know, it has to uh, create the branding and it uh, carries out leasehold improvements. And the benefits of all that would only be realized if the bank had those premises for say four years or even a longer period. Now in that case, even though the non-cancellable period is only two years, you can't take that as the lease term. It would be the longer four year period or perhaps even longer. And what this means is that it would make sense to have some clarity around the lease term in the contract if that is not already the case. Right, so let's now look at the initial recognition of lease liability. So we've identified the lease. How do you recognize the lease liability? 
it is the present value of outstanding lease payments. And the lease payments include the fixed payments, including the in substance fixed payments. So for example, let's say the contract uh, say states that the rent for premises escalates by higher of 3% per annum and increase in price index. So it escalates by higher of 3% per annum and increase in price index. Let's say the retail price index. Now the 3% is unavoidable. That's the minimum increase. And that should be included when you are calculating the future cash outflows. Variable lease payments that depend on an index or a rate should also be included. So say there is increase in rent based on inflation index that should be incorporated. So at each date when there has been an increased increase assessed in respect of the future payments, you would need to recalculate the future cash outflows and discount them back using the original discount rate to get the revised lease liability. However, if there are payments which are based on turnover or payments which are based on usage, then they are not included partly because they are very difficult to estimate. And such payments which are based on turnover or based on usage uh, should be recognized as expense, as normal rental expense, when the events that trigger the payment happens. The exercise price of purchase option should be included if lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option. That's what you've concluded using your judgment. And penalties for terminating the lease if the lease term reflects the lessee exercising an option to terminate the lease. And the residual value guarantees from the lessee to the lessor should also be included. So there is quite a lot of work involved in particular where there are arrangements with option to extend the lease. Now the lease liabilities that will appear on the balance sheet are financial liabilities and they will be measured in accordance with the leasing standard in the S116 and not in the S109 which is to do with financial instruments financial liabilities. However, they are also subject to the disclosure requirement in INDAS 107, which is to do with financial instruments disclosures. And that requires disclosure of based on the maturity analysis. So it is the undiscounted amounts, the actual cash outflows in respect of lease, uh, lease arrangements being disclosed in different time buckets up to five years between zero and one year, one to two years and so on up to five years and then the total after five years. So the users know what exactly is going to be the cash outflow in each time bucket in respect of the current leasing arrangements. So we uh, have hello, to- Hello, uh, yeah, second. Hi. Yeah, yeah, one minute. Uh, I request all attendee, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, put through the webinar. There is an option available where we you can put your uh, questions. So so that at the end of session, we can uh, we can actually pick up that question and then Saket can help help you on that. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, Saket, yeah. uh, for uh, in between. No, that's fine. No, I should have mentioned at the outset. So feel free to put your questions and uh, we will uh, look at uh, those time permitting or you can be in touch after that also if we don't have time. But we will leave some time at the end for questions. So feel free, please do put forward the questions. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so moving on, we said the lease liability is the present value of the future cash payments uh, or likely cash payments and uh, we have looked at in the previous slide uh, 
what all should be considered in determining the future cash payments, but we do need to discount those. And the rate used as the discount rate is the rate implicit in the lease. And in short, that is the lessor's internal rate of return. Now, the problem with that is how would the lessee know the lessor's internal rate of return? Because the lessee may not know the unguaranteed residual value that is kind of promised to the lessor by a third party. The lessee may not know the lessor's initial direct costs as also the fair value of the underlying asset. So if the rate implicit in the lease cannot be determined, which is quite likely, then the standard says that the lessee must use the incremental borrowing rate. And this is where you know, part of the fun begins because what is the lessee's incremental borrowing rate? It is the rate of interest, and this is actually from the standard, the words in the standard. So it is the rate of interest that a lessee would have to pay to borrow over a similar term as the lease term and with similar security as the asset that is obtained. The funds necessary to obtain an asset of similar value to the right of use asset in a similar economic environment. So for example, if you've taken a building on lease for 10 years and you are making, let's say for simplicity, annual payments, the incremental borrowing rate would be the rate at which you could borrow from the bank, for example, with the same installments as the lease payments that you are making over the 10 year period with the building or the asset being the security for that borrowing. So what this means is that the incremental borrowing rate is based on the asset that is leased. And if you lease two assets, let's say building and motor vehicle, different assets at the same time, the incremental borrowing rate for each of those would be different because you have to look at what rate you could borrow based on the security of that asset, which you have the right to use. And again, you have to also look at the economic environment. So if you are operating in different jurisdictions, let's say, for example, in India, you're also operating in, let's say, Nigeria, then the economic environment is different. So you have to take that also into account. However, one of the practical expedience is the use of a weighted average rate, which is allowed for a portfolio of leases with similar characteristics. So for example, if you, let's say if a company leased uh, 50 motor vehicles for, uh, between let's say January to March of this year, then it can combine all of them as long as the motor vehicles are approximately of the same specification and have similar characteristics in terms of the leasing arrangements. So it is possible to apply the standard to portfolio of leases with similar characteristics, provided you can demonstrate that the effect is not materially different from applying the standard to individual leases. So we've looked at determination of a lease liability. We will also come to briefly to an example uh, on that. But what is the right of use asset? Now the right of use asset is actually based on the lease liability. So you start with the lease liability and add to that any lease payments, advance payments that have already been made, because that will not be reflected in the lease liability, and add to that the initial direct costs of entering into the lease, and add the estimated cost to dismantle, remove, or restore, which is a part of the end AS uh, 
37 wherein you are required to make a provision for costs that you would in incur at the end of the useful life of the asset to dismantle it and restore the place to its original condition. And in some industries, this can be quite significant. For example, oil and gas industries have huge provisions for this, but it could apply to other industries if you've carried out significant leasehold improvements to the premises, and then at the end of the lease, when you vacate it, you are required to restore it to its original condition, then you do need to provide for it if it is material. And any lease incentives received are adjusted here to get the right of use asset. So the key thing here is that the right of use asset is based on the lease liability with some adjustments. So let's look at an example here, just to be very clear about what this all means. Uh, it's a quite a straightforward, simple example. So 1st April 2019, three-year lease of office premises. Let's say the rentals are currency unit, any currency, 10,000 payable at the end of each year. Nothing else uh, which is uh, complicated here. We'll keep it simple and the applicable discount rate is 5%. So the initial measurement of the right of use asset and lease liability is the discounted value of the 10,000 payable at the end of each year for the next three years and the discount rate used is 5%. So we get 27,232 and that will be the right of use asset and the lease liability that is recognized at commencement of the lease. Now, we have a lease term here, which is three years. So at the end of three years, we should not have any right of use asset. And so we will amortize that right of use asset over three years. So in the bottom table on your screen, you can see the amortization expense is 27,232 divided by three, assuming straight line, uh, 9,077, and that reduces the right of use asset through the accumulated amortization account. On the lease liability, we will recognize finance cost at 5%. So it is like unwinding of the discount, uh, but here we have to do the calculations and uh, that comes to 1,362. Now we're making a cash payment of 10,000 every year, out of which 1,362 is the interest component. So the remaining is the reduction of the principal amount of the lease liability, which is 8,638. So next year, the opening balance of the lease liability is going to be 27,232 less the 8,638 on which finance cost is calculated and it will be lower than the 1,362 that we have in 2019-20. And if you keep doing that, uh, the right of use asset will be amortized completely and the lease liability will also become zero uh, at the end of three years. But what this is doing is reflecting the substance of the arrangement, whether you actually borrow money, take a loan from the bank and buy the asset, or whether you lease the asset, the financial statements become more comparable. Also, one thing I, I must mention is uh, here we've assumed that the right of use asset is based on the cost model, but there is an option in NDS to apply the revaluation model by class of assets, and it is possible to revalue the right of use asset also. But revaluation also means that you still have to depreciate that asset, and when the lease term expires, its value to the lessee is still going to be zero. So this is how it would look over the years. 
the right of use asset amortizes on a straight line basis but the lease liability reduces but not exactly on the same basis and that is because the payment of 10000 that we are making every year is towards interest and repayment of the liability there's a higher interest component in the initial years and lower in the latter years and you can see that in the pnl table below so the total expense over the three years is still the same but within the three years each of the years the impact on the pnl is different and just to be very clear ebitda which is earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization is going to be higher as a result of adopting india's 116 because we don't have rental expense anymore which would have been a deduction in calculating ebitda but instead we have depreciation and finance cost which appears in line uh, lines below the ebitda and ebitda is very important because we are using that often as a multiple enterprise value to ebitda for example and that is used to value companies again the valuation of companies may not be affected but the inputs that go into the valuation would be due to this impact of the standard on financial matrix so what's the impact we've just seen ebitda is going to be higher we have interest cover interest cover is kind of your earnings before interest and tax divided by the interest expense and this will also improve because of higher increase in ebitda than finance costs and also a weaker net debt to ebitda ratio so there'll be higher increase in debt or borrowings than in EBITDA. So the interest cover will actually improve. The earnings per share is going to be lower in early years due to lower profits. And why would the profits be lower in the early years of a lease? Because we have a higher interest charge due to a higher liability being recognized in the early years the gearing is going to be higher there's going to be liabilities recognized on the balance sheet the current ratio which is current assets divided by your current liabilities now the lease liability is going to be split between current and non-current portion because there's going to be an amount payable in the next 12 months so the current liability increases and as a result the current ratio is going to be lower compared to the previous standard and asset turnover is your revenues divided by uh, assets and the assets go up so the asset turnover ratio is going to be lower so if these are used in analyzing financial statements there is going to be an impact and it is important that the management and stakeholders are uh, made aware of the impact that they are going to see as a result of adopting this standard so let's run through lease modifications this is again another area which uh, requires use of judgment one of the things is that you know the lease term could change during the lease uh, for example initially you thought that you would exercise the option to extend the lease but then you might say well we've grown a lot we need bigger premises and we will not exercise the option to extend the lease so there is a change in the lease term or you might decide to probably rent more space or give up some space so there could be increase or decrease in the space that is rented 
So one of the key things is that when there is a modification, we need to first assess whether that modification is a separate lease or not. And it is a separate, it is a new lease if there is an addition to the right of use asset at the standalone selling price. What that means is we've now got a separately identifiable asset. It is not actually directly related to the right of use asset that we already have. And we've taken that on approximately at the market price. In that case, you treat it as a separate right of use asset and lease liability. But if lease modification results in an adjustment to the existing lease, they're very much interrelated or there's a big discount given because there is already an asset that is leased by the lessee currently, then it is not a separate lease and you have to remeasure the lease liability. And when you do that, a new discount rate should be applied and there would also be an adjustment to the right of use asset. So one of the key takeaways here is that once you have identified the right of use asset and lease liability at commencement of the lease, there could be changes subsequently and continuous reassessment is required if there are any changes likely to exercising the option or not, or the space that would be rented, or um, uh, even uh, changes to the business. Because if you're not doing well, you might say, well, we're not going to extend the lease, for example. So effective from 1st April 2019, there are two methods and it is important to be aware about what the impact of each of the methods would be. If it is a full retrospective approach, then effectively you restate the comparatives, which means that 2019-20, as well as the comparative 2018-19, will be as per India's 116. The problem with that is you should have done all the work earlier and um, you know organizations may not have had all the data let's say on 1st of april 2018 to actually adjust the comparatives so the more popular method is the modified retrospective approach wherein you actually adjust the opening retained earnings on 1st april 2019 the comparatives will be as per the previous standard. Now, how do you do the calculations? Well, on 1st April 2019, the lease liability is going to be the present value of all the future payments, which are discounted using an appropriate rate, let's say the incremental borrowing rate on 1st April 2019. With regards to the right of use asset, a simple option is to take it at the same amount as the lease liability, which means there is not going to be any impact on retained earnings. The other option in the modified retrospective approach is to calculate the lease liability at the commencement of the lease, which may have been, let's say, 1st of April 2017. So on 1st of April 2017, you take all the future lease payments, discount them using the incremental borrowing rate at the date of transition, which is 1st April 2019, and use that as a right of use asset, which will then be amortized for two years from 1st April 2017 to 19. And these, this would create some retained earnings impact. But one of the big practical expedients is grandfathering existing contracts. So we looked at earlier a new definition of lease. Now, what that would mean is that arrangements that were existing arrangements that were not leases as per the previous standard could become leases under the new standard and arrangements that were 
leases under the previous standard may not qualify as leases under the new standard. So grandfathering existing contracts means saying that, look, if you conclude it that under the previous standard, an arrangement was a lease, you assume that it is a lease under the new standard also. And if you concluded previously that the arrangement is not a lease, then under the new standard, you assume it is not a lease. But all contracts from 1st April 2019 would need to be assessed under the definition in NDS 116. So some of the practical considerations are reviewing contracts to identify the leases, extract, gather, and validate lease data, redesign of IT systems and processes. So for example, what you previously did on a spreadsheet may not be possible uh, unless you have very, very few leases. Uh, are the bank covenants be, being affected because you've got more lease liabilities, more debt on the balance sheet? Transition approach, which one are you taking? The full retrospective, modified retrospective? And not to forget, under NDS, you always have more presentation and disclosure especially, and a lot of the disclosures required now are in tabular format. So again, can you automate those disclosures? And what are the controls around all of these things need to be thought through? So if you are a lessor, all good news. What we've discussed until now is mainly lessee accounting and the impact is if you had operating leases. Lessor accounting doesn't change. Everyone's happy with the operating and finance lease classification. And the reason is because if you are a lessor and let's say you conclude that the lease is an operating lease, you continue to recognize the asset on the balance sheet. And all you recognize is the rental income from the lessee. If it is a finance lease classification for the lessor, then what the lessor says is that the risk and rewards have been transferred, the asset will be derecognized, but we recognize a lease receivable. So we still have an asset on the balance sheet. So the issue with operating leases on the lessee side do not exist on the lessor side, but more disclosures are required in tabular format and also around the leasing activities of the lessor. Sale and lease back, again, it was sometimes used as sort of an off balance sheet financing arrangement. So what happens here is, let's say you've got a big uh, office building, um, let's say it's worth 50 crores and you want financing. You can sell the asset, and the buyer leases it back to you. So it's a financing arrangement where you sell the asset, get paid the full 50 crores market value, and then you still continue to use the asset in the business and pay rentals to the buyer who becomes a lessor. Now with the new standard, if you sell it and lease it back, the asset has to come back on the balance sheet as a right of use asset. So if the transfer qualifies as a sale, and for that you need to look at NDS uh, 115 on revenue, then the lessee derecognizes the underlying asset and recognizes back the right of use asset under the lease back. And the lessor will recognize the underlying asset, the physical asset, and apply less or accounting, classify it as either operating or finance lease. If the transfer does not qualify as a sale, then it is more like a financing arrangement and the lessee, the seller, uh, well, the seller basically, there is no lease here, so the seller recognizes uh, a financial liability for the amount received from the buyer, 
and the buyer will effectively recognize a lending transaction like a financial asset uh, for the payment that has been made. That is if the transfer does not qualify as a sale. Right, so that was an overview of IND AS116. Uh, again, I would like to say that certain sectors would be more impacted than others because they tend to have operating lease arrangements. So we have retail, which is highly affected. We saw the example of future retail. Airlines, transport, telecommunications, hotels, hospitals, uh, they all would be affected. For example, hospitals, healthcare, they tend to have leased equipments. Uh, hotels, immovable property and vehicles. Or telecom companies have the sharing of the infrastructure, facilities and so on. So or certain industries will have huge impact uh, as a result of this standard. Okay, that's it from me, so I'll pass it back to uh, Jitendra if there's any questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. thank you, Saket, uh, for this presentation. Uh, so, yeah, Saket, we have a question. Uh, one is, uh, th threshold exemption uh, limit for individual asset or group of asset? Uh, the low value asset is for individual asset. So it is on a lease by lease basis, yeah? So if you okay. have uh, one photocopier, which is let's say uh, $500, uh, you can take an exemption. And if you have a lease, uh, let's say 20 leases of same photocopiers, but each lease is under the threshold, you can still take the exemption. Okay, okay. Yeah. And the, another question is, if company has an agreement with, with this agreement is having a right to renew uh, to the company with the transporter for deploying specific bulker and the bulker is using for the moment of uh, finished goods. So, so uh, to uh, lease uh, on company uh, and in this case, the company can recognize this asset uh, in its books because they are having the right to renew uh, with this agreement with the transporter. So I think to recognize it under this standard as a right of use asset, you need to look through the definition. So there is an identified asset and there is a right to control, which means that the customer can, uh, you know, has the right to direct the use of the asset for what purpose it is used, when it is used, and also uh, the fact that it has rights to substantially all of the economic benefits from use of the asset. So if it meets that definition, then it is a lease. And once you've identified it as a lease, then you look through uh, and try and assess the lease term. So if there is a right to renew after that, then you have to, uh, look at, and this may involve use of judgment on, you know, what is the likelihood of it being renewed? And that would affect the lease term and hence the calculation of the lease liability. But, you know, the right to renew in itself may not lead, in my opinion, to a lease under this standard. You have to first look through the definition. Uh, okay, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Saket, for uh, all these uh, two questions, uh, the answer you have provided. And uh, thanks for this today's presentation. It's uh, one of the uh, very key important leases. I know it's not that easy chapter, but you have actually given a very uh, detailed understanding about these standards and uh, the clarity also you have provided. And thanks for all participation uh, for this uh, today's session. If you have any query, please uh, let us know. Uh, from our side, we'll definitely uh, try to see uh, all your queries get resolved uh, in due course. Right. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for Thank attending. You. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.